Awesome. We're getting underway here on Thursday, April 10th. We are going to cover the section on personality this morning. Remember, test number two comes up on Tuesday. We start at 9.30. If you show up later than 9.45, remember, unfortunately, or 9.55, 25 minutes, unfortunately, you won't be given a test. You'll get a zero. So make sure you show up um, on time for the test on Tuesday morning. I gave you guys the breakdown um, in our face-to-face -face class session on Tuesday. I can just reiterate that verbally here. There will be nine questions on intelligence, 11 on development, 8 on emotion, stress, and health, and 12 um, questions will come from this section on personality that we're going to cover this morning. Um, in the section on personality, we're going to begin by talking about some definitions um, and a working definition for personality. We're going to talk about nature versus nurture as it relates to personality, so we usually end with that in one of our topic areas, but today we're actually going to begin with that. Um, then we'll get into various different um, approaches to personality assessment. What's nice about that is it's a, a good way to bookend part three of our course, which began with a discussion about intelligence assessment and now ends with a discussion of personality assessment. And the major part of our discussion today, as you'll see, will be um, a review of the major theories of personality. Okay, that's what we're going to be doing um, in terms of the lay of the land for today. So to help you organize your notes, that's the best way um, that I can kind of help you get the structure going here. Okay? So let's begin with our definition, then we'll talk about nature and nurture, and move on from there. So um, in terms of a definition of personality, what we mean by personality, this definition is probably good enough. It refers to characteristics, emotional responses, thoughts and behaviors that are relatively stable over time and across circumstances. And I would focus here on the stability, both in a temporal sense, that means over time, as well as in a situational sense, across different circumstances. So this means that if you are an outgoing person, right, if we think about that as your personality trait down the bottom here, you're pretty extroverted. It's an enduring quality that you have. You've been that way since you were little, and you are that way today, whether it's at school, at work, hanging out with friends, going back home to visit your mom and dad, going to your grandma's house, whatever it is, that's the way that you are consistently. It's enduring, it's stable, it's consistent, right? It's a pattern of emotional response. It's, it's a way of thinking. It's specific behaviors that tend to basically characterize you, right? If someone were to describe you, they'd say, oh, he's really outgoing or she's really outgoing. Or they might say, he's a really dependable person, right? He shows up on time for things. When he tells you he's going to do something, he does it. Oh, she's really, really thoughtful. When different events come up, she's always the one to remember somebody's birthday or somebody's anniversary or to do something thoughtful when somebody is having a difficult time. So that's what we mean by personality. We're really going to focus in on personality traits. And as you'll see later on, the fourth of the four major theories we're going to review basically focuses in on these personality traits and, 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 and says that's really the best way to understand personality, is to think about those traits. And we're going to talk about something called the five-factor model, sometimes referred to as the big five model of personality. And the major focus there is on these personality traits and what they look like, again, both over time and in different situations. So the question we're going to answer next after defining personality and personality traits in this way is to what degree are these traits heritable? Right? The nature versus nurture issue that we began part three of the course with, with respect to discussing intelligence. Right there, we're talking about twin studies and adoption studies. Is intelligence genetically driven? Is it environmentally driven? To what degree do those factors play a role? Well, let's have that discussion now briefly regarding personality. I'm going to skip that slide and go right to this one and tell you that the answer basically is that the research that's been done about the genetic contribution to personality is pretty clear, and it's pretty clear that all personality traits have a genetic component. Okay? It doesn't say that there's a genetic dictate to personality, but whether you're looking at data from twin studies or data from adoption studies, 
it's pretty clear that there is a genetic contribution. So if you want to put this in your notes under the heading of nature versus nurture, right, that's what we're talking about yet again. We talked about it with respect to intelligence. We talked about nature versus nurture for language development, right, when we introduced the idea of a critical period hypothesis. Well, for personality, it seems that genes predispose us to certain personality traits that have certain kinds of behavioral tendencies, right? We can infer the underlying personality trait is present from what you do, right? And that's the point of these personality traits down below here, neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness, all of those things are discernible to us by way of the way by means of the way that we behave in different situations. So we've got twin study data here right on the slide for you to help you understand what this research has shown. And what it has clearly shown is that there's a genetic contribution to um, these personality traits. So let's talk about monozygotic versus dizygotic twins. This is a little review, right? We already know this. This is something you're responsible for from earlier on in this section of the course, the monozygotic twins, we said, are 100% the same genetically. The dizygotic twins, in contrast here, 50% of their genes. Look at the graph here, okay? The green bars are always bigger than the orange bars. Well, what's on the x-axis? So these various traits on the y-axis, the correlation between different twin pairs, right? Different twin pair types. The green bars are identical twins. The orange bars are the fraternal twins. So the fact that the green bars are bigger than the orange bars says that you, if you're more similar to someone genetically, you are likely to be more similar to them with respect to these various different personality traits. Okay? So when the green is bigger than the orange, that indicates a genetic contribution to that outcome. So how does this come about? Well, the researchers basically argue that temperament might be an early indicator of what personality might ultimately become. So the way I think about temperament is it's one of the first glimpses that we get at personality. And we talked about temperament, right, in our discussion of um, attachment, right, activity level in an infant, the infant's level of emotionality, how much do they cry, basically. Right, sociability, how much do they cling to mom or dad's leg when they meet new people? Or how excited are they to meet new people? How open are they to having those different kinds of experiences and not being guarded and shy and reserved? Okay, so temperament gives us an early look here. Now, if you're looking at these green bars that represent the data for the monozygotic twins, and we see correlations ranging from about 0.4 to about 0.6, what can you conclude about the role that nurture plays? Is there a role here for nurture? Tell me in the chat box. Or is this totally genetically driven? Is nurture going to play a role? Does nurture matter? It definitely does. How do you know that? Or what would be going on with those green bars if this was totally genetically driven, if personality was dictated by your genes fully and completely? That correlation coefficient, very good, Quinn, does not equal one. If it did, that would indicate that it's a genetic dictate, because these people who are exactly the same genetically would necessarily then be exactly the same in terms of personality. And they are exactly the same genetically. That's what the green bar models I got twins are about, right? But they're not exactly the same. They're pretty similar, not gigantic correlations like we saw with what identical twins that reared apart for intelligence. It was 0.75. That's bigger than any of these. So in fact, when we look at personality, it looks like there's even more wiggle room for nurture to come in and exert its influence um, in terms of this outcome, looking at how we um, behave in terms of these personality traits, okay? So the take home message is definitely genes matter. All personality traits have a genetic component to them, but there is plenty of room here for environmental factors to exert their influence as well, okay? Any questions about what's displayed here, what the graphic means, or any of the points that I've made about the genetic contribution to personality?
if you've got it, please tell me in the chat box you're there, because sometimes I feel like I'm just talking into the void and I'm not sure if you're really good, good, okay. Um, and just to, to let you guys know, I mentioned at the beginning we were chatting before class, I am on the Campus Network. Today I happen to be on campus to do this session. Um, so I've got fingers crossed just like you guys do. The fallback would be I've got a full recording of the session from the 8 o'clock class and if everything just, you know, went down the tubes with us, I could always send you guys a link to that one. All right? So let's um, say if we go back to this first page, we've taken care of a, a look at a definition, so that's good nature and nurture. So next up is a little review of personality assessment approaches. Let's take a look at ways of trying to measure, right, ways of trying to quantify personality. And what I like about being able to do this here at the end of part three of the course is it bookends part three because we started part three by talking about intelligence assessment, right, and so the issues we talked about there, right, in terms of reliability and validity and standardization. They're relevant here as well. And we're going to talk about two major approaches to personality assessment. One approach is known as objective testing, and the other approach is known, is known as projective testing. What does objective testing involve? Well, if I use an objective test like the MMPI-2, what I'm going to do is give the person a series of questions and ask them to self-report about their personality. In fact, the MMPI-2, believe it or not, consists of 567 true-false items. You're probably wondering what MMPI stands for. Let me tell you, it's a mouthful here. It is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Oh, I almost fit it completely on the slide. So I like MMPI-2 better, right? It's 567 items, true or false. And basically, you're asked to go through these items and identify the degree to which the statements are true for you most of the time or maybe not true for you most of the time, right? So there might be an item that says something like, I enjoy meeting new people, true or false. There might be an item that says, I like to do outdoor activities, true or false. Um, reading is a favorite hobby of mine, true or false, okay? Sometimes I feel sad, true or false, right? So describe yourself for us is basically the task when you're given the MMPI-2, okay? What's really, really good about the MMPI-2 is that it has very good reliability and very good validity. So let's remember what those are about, right? Reliability can come in two forms. It can either be in the form of test, retest reliability. That is, you take the MMPI to today on April 10th, you come back and take it on May 10th, and your scores correlate very, very highly. Okay, well, that's one way of talking about reliability, and it's really good in that regard. That's test, retest reliability. We can also talk about inter-rater reliability, and this becomes even more important when we talk about personality assessment. That is, if three or four psychologists were to look at your results on the MMPI-2, would they arrive at similar or the same kinds of conclusions? Would there be consistency across the judges, if you will, of your personality inventory responses? And the answer is yes. For the MMPI-2, that's really, really good. Is there validity to this measure, right? Validity, we said, was truthfulness. If reliability was consistency. Validity is truthfulness. Is it really measuring personality? Well, I can show you some sample items on this next slide. You don't need to memorize these different scales. You don't need to memorize individual items, right? But here are some sample items. On the depression scale, there are items that look something like this. I often feel that life is not worth the trouble. If you're going to score high on that depression scale, tell me in the chat box, would you say true or false to that item? If the scoring will ultimately put you high on that scale, you're probably going to say true to that. The paranoia scale. We've got a statement here that says several people are following me everywhere. Well, that's another one where you would say true to it if you were going to score high on that dimension. Schizophrenia, I seem to hear things that other people cannot hear. 
true, and so forth. Ultimately, what happens with the MMPI-2 is you get a profile of your scores. You do not need to memorize this giant list of scales on the MMPI-2. If you take a personality class here in the psych department, you'll have to learn what those are and what they're about. You don't need to know that for intro. Ultimately, what is produced by the MMPI-2 is this profile scores, right? We're showing where you're scoring higher, where you're scoring lower. This person's scoring into what they call the clinically significant range. That means probably in the top 5 or 10% of all respondents on the depression scale. They're also scoring pretty high on this psychasthenia scale. It's like an OCD type scale. Okay. Now, I've said that this MMPI-2 has good reliability and good validity, but I've also said that it's a self-report measure. Tell me in the chat box, what concerns do you have when we take this approach of getting information right from the horse's mouth? Tell me about yourself. Lies, people lying. The good news is we can detect lying on the MMPI-2 because they are built into the MMPI-2, these things known as validity scales, right? Validity scales are basically a subset of items, and this is one of the reasons why this instrument has so many items. We build in some scales that catch you when you're lying, and it turns out that lying can take one of two forms. Lying can come in the form of what we refer to as faking bad, and it can come in the form of faking good. Faking bad on an MMPI-2 means that you try to exaggerate your problems. You could be sitting in a jail cell and you murdered your entire family and your defense is an insanity defense and you're taking the MMPI-2 as part of the forensic evaluation that they're doing. And so when you see items that say, everyone is following me, I say true, but it turns out we've got some items in there that you might think indicate problems, but they really don't. Like there might be an item that says, everything that I eat tastes sweet to me. And I'm sitting in my jail, so I'm like, that sounds, that sounds like an insanity defense. Kind of, I'm going to say true to that. That's a faking bad item. No one says true to that. Only people who are lying and trying to make themselves look like they're doing worse than they really are do that. Faking good is in the opposite direction. You get an item that says something like, I like everyone I've ever met. Come on. Right? You say true to that because you're trying to present yourself in an overly favorable light. Maybe you're in another legal situation where they're going to put you um, under a conservatorship where somebody else is going to make decisions for you, and you want to minimize problems that might, in fact, be true, that might be present, and so you do this faking good. Okay. Again, we can detect that, and basically the first thing that the MMPI-2 produces in the computerized scoring is an assessment of those validity scales, and it tells you whether you should go on and interpret what else is in the report. Okay, it will ding it and red flag it and basically say, don't even proceed because this person has been faking good or they've been faking bad. That's one approach, right? Go to the horse's mouth, get self-report, let this person tell them, tell us about themselves. The other approach is to take the projective testing approach, and it is an approach that is very, very different, and it's an approach that is predicated on the projective hypothesis. What is that? Well, the key part of the projective hypothesis involves exposing you to various ambiguous stimuli, and those ambiguous stimuli can be things like ink blots, they can be things like pictures, to which you are going to respond. And the idea here is this. The idea is that you are going to project onto those ambiguous stimuli different aspects of your personality. So the Rorschach is one example of a projective test. This is the one that involves showing you a bunch of ink blots and recording your responses and then interpreting those responses with respect to your personality functioning. The TAT involves showing you a bunch of ambiguous looking pictures. By the way, the TAT stands for the Thematic Apperception 
test, just in case you're curious, you'll see that and read about that in the textbook as well. Again, the idea is give you some ambiguous stimuli, let you process them, let you think about them, let you respond to them, and your responses will inadvertently reveal to me as the interpreter of your responses things about yourself. So if we were to do a Rorschach, we'll do a mini Rorschach administration right now to the 50 of you who are logged in here, right? I'm going to hand you this card, and I'm going to say, what might this be? That's all I'm allowed to say in terms of standardized administration. And go. Lots of people seeing a clown. So looking at the whole blot and seeing the big red feet, those shoes. Now Selena is seeing a fish. Somebody's seeing a cow, a penguin, a dog, a panda, a robber. Okay. Somebody sees grandma okay, with the big yellowish hair, I'm guessing there. In the middle here, if you looked at this just part of it, what might you see when you look at this instead of the whole blot? You might see a bat or a dove or two birds or a butterfly. You might see two people here touching hands. Okay. Aubrey is seeing Batman. Okay. So you are projecting onto these ambiguous stimuli your aspects of your personality. Okay? Give you another one. What might this be? How might you respond to that one? A monster, the rabbit from Donnie Darko, a bear, a dead bear, a spider's face, skull and bones, a panda, a monster. Okay, this is all interesting. Here's the big problem with these projective tests, is that they have weak reliability and they have weak validity. What do I mean by weak reliability? Well, in particular, when we want to talk about inter-rater reliability, let me just sneak that term in here, right? Inter-rater reliability means do I get consistent ratings across the different evaluators of your responses? Right? It's like the judges at the Olympic skating competition, right? Is there consistency in their scoring? Well, you guys gave a whole bunch of different responses here. What if I were to look at one of you and your individual responses to these different Rorschach ink plots? And I would typically give you 10 of them and let you respond as many times as you wanted to each. And I interpreted your responses as meaning that you have antisocial tendencies, you don't care about the rights of others, um, and that you might have um, a tendency to engage in criminal behavior. I'm just making that up. Okay? Based on your responses to an ink plot, that's what I've inferred. Another psychologist looks at it and says, this is a very positive person who um, is connected with other people and social relationships are very important to them. What? Two totally different depictions of your personality based on your responses to these ambiguous stimuli. That's the problem. It's weak with respect to reliability, and it's weak with respect to validity. Remember, validity is truthfulness. Is my measure really measuring what I say it measures? Tell me in the chat box, besides personality, what else do you think we're inadvertently measuring when we get your responses to these ambiguous stimuli, to these ink blots? What else are we kind of picking up? Imagination, right? How imaginative are you? How creative are you? Absolutely. There's no doubt that those elements are part of what we're getting here. Right? Are you creative? Are you imaginative? Do you have sort of a, a, a rich um, fantasy life in, in your mind, right? thinking about these different kinds of things? So those are the big, big problems with the projective test. Right? When we've got good reliability and good validity for these guys up above, we don't have that for the projective test down below. And in fact, if you ask me, Dr. LeMakes, what would be your preference if you had to do some kind of personality assessment? And I don't really do much of this at all. What would you recommend that I do? I'd recommend that you use objective testing. I'd probably recommend that you use something like EMMPI2 to get a sense of what's going on with that person. Okay? The other um, projective test I just want to show you very briefly is the TAT. There's a picture here from your textbook, right? I show you a 
a relatively ambiguous picture. This woman is sort of leaning on or holding open a door. She's got one hand over her eyes. And we're looking for themes. We're going to give you maybe six or eight of these cards with these pictures on them. And your task is to tell us a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Tell us what's going on for the people in this story. What are they thinking? How are they feeling? Okay? And then we're going to progress from there and try to look for themes. Maybe if each of your stories has something to do with a person feeling alone and lonely, isolated from others, disconnected from society, that's a recurrent theme. Maybe that tells us something about you yourself. It may or it may not. That's a question of validity, right? Does that truthfully mean that you feel that way? Or is there something sometimes in the supposedly ambiguous stimuli that maybe pulls for stories with those kinds of themes? Again, big questions around reliability and validity. How do multiple scorers interpret your responses? And are we really measuring personality? Or as you guys said down below, are we measuring your level of imagination, your level of creativity, your cognitive sophistication, right? That's the big concern here with this projective approach to personality assessment. All right? Any questions about those two approaches? I want you to be able to know what each one is about and then be able to compare and contrast them. So if I were to describe a scenario where a psychologist was doing a personality assessment with someone, and I said they did blah, 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 and I described one of these approaches or the other approach, would you be able to recognize it? Or would you be able to talk about issues related to reliability and validity for these tests, right? We said the Wexler test for intelligence have good reliability, good validity. Which of these have good reliability and validity? Well, that was the objective test with the MMPI-2 being one example. Okay? Questions? Any confusion with that at all? Excellent. We're making good time here. So what did I say was up next on our list of things to do? We've taken care of personality assessment now, too. So let's check that off. We're going to use the remainder of our time. We've got about 50 minutes to do so in a review of the major theories of personality. And we're going to take a look at four different major perspectives on personality, or really four different major theories. And I'm going to give you some names here to match up with these theories, although you know I very rarely ask you a test question that hinges on getting the guy's name right. Humanistic theory, after psychodynamic theory is Freud, humanistic theory is going to be Maslow and Rogers, Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. Cognitive social learning theory is going to be Bandura. Do you guys remember that name? Where did we encounter Bandura before? What was he involved with? You guys remember? Yes, right? Carolyn says the Bobo doll. Yes, he's the observational learning guy. So think about it. What do you think his theory is going to say drives personality? Probably you learn to be the way that you are in terms of personality by watching moms and dads and brothers and sisters, right? And then Raymond Cattell is going to be the name associated with the five-factor model. So we're going to take a look at each of these. Now, on the front end, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to spend more time on Freud's psychodynamic theory than any of the other theories. We're probably going to spend about 25 minutes on him, and then probably the other 25 minutes on the other three combined. That doesn't mean I think he's three times more important than each of those remaining three theories. We need to spend a lot of time on Freud because his is a very comprehensive model, first of all. And second of all, his model is the model to which some of these other models are responding when they lay out their ideas about personality. And you'll see it most clearly when we look at Maslow and Rogers. These guys are directly responding to some of the criticisms of Freud, Freud's model. Right? They're going to say, Freud has too much sex and aggression too much of an emphasis on hang-ups in your childhood, and we should talk about something else that is driving personality, and that something else is going to be things like your goals in life, your growth potential. So it's going to be a much more positive and optimistic tone to their model, and in order to understand why they emphasize those things, you've got to understand Freud on the front end. So let's talk about Freud. Freud's model 
says that personality is rooted in unconscious conflicts between our desires and our actual experiences. So let's highlight some big ideas, right? We've already talked about the unconscious being so key for Freud, right? In fact, the behaviorists use his emphasis on the unconscious to vote him off the island of psychology because they say, as behavior, psychology should be the science of observable behaviors. Well, he's got all this unconscious stuff. It's not even psychology anymore, right? He says we've got conflicts between our desires and our actual experiences. So there's a discrepancy here between what we really, really want and what we're actually experiencing on an everyday basis. So what does that mean? Well, the desires might be some kind of sexual impulse. The desires might be some kind of aggressive or a violent impulse. We have those desires, those feelings during our waking hours, right? But our actual experiences during those waking hours are very different. We don't fulfill those sexual or aggressive or violent impulses. So maybe then what happens is those things show up symbolically, unconsciously, in our dreams, right? Symbolic wish fulfillment is how Freud accounted for dreams, as we talked about in the section on consciousness, okay? So he's basically saying, you know, to give you a non-sexual scenario, right? He's saying something like, you have these violent and aggressive impulses you feel towards your boss at work. He or she really can get under your skin, really annoy you, and what you really want to do is engage in some kind of aggressive or violent behavior, right? You might have a part of your personality. We're going to talk about the id in a little bit. This primitive part of your personality that wants to hit your boss in the head with a brick, okay? There is your desire. Your actual experience every day is that you don't do that. That's what Freud says is making us tick. His model also has this notion of psychic determinism, which basically boils down to the idea that in terms of your behavior and your thinking and your feeling, none of that happens by chance. In other words, at an individual level, I'm not saying that nothing in the entire world or the entire universe happens by chance. What he's saying is that at an individual level of analysis, looking at you as one person, your individual thoughts and feelings and behaviors don't come from nowhere. They are not random. They're driven by something. There's a deterministic feel here. And if we were to dig around long enough and were to interpret things correctly, maybe from your dreams or some other kinds of unconscious material, we would arrive at an understanding of what's making you do what you're doing, right? Nothing happens by chance. In fact, when you extend this out to its extreme, we have this notion of a Freudian slip. Have you ever heard of a Freudian slip? And it's not something that his wife wore. What's a Freudian slip? Well, it's when you say something and you sort of stumble over your words in such a way as to maybe reveal something about what you're really thinking about. Can you think of an example of a Freudian slip? Anybody have one that they can toss into the chat box? I usually come up with one where, you know, maybe you're thinking about some kind of, you know, sexual impulse, you're at a party, and instead of say you say you might say your ex's name, you might you might say to your friend, dude, this is the best part, I mean, this is the best party ever, right? You stumble upon it and say it that way. You meet someone new at that party and you say, I don't think we've been seduced. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't think we've been introduced. Got one built into the slides here, right? Good morning, beheaded. Uh, I mean, beloved, right? Why is she saying beheaded? Freud says that's not for nothing. That comes from somewhere, right? She says this. So what is that beheaded thing all about? Maybe she has some hidden feelings towards this guy, right? Again, psychic determinism. Nothing that we do or say or think or feel uh, comes from nowhere. If we dig around enough, we will find the reasons why. And very often, according to Freud, the reasons why are down here in the unconscious mind. So the major thing you want to emphasize here within his model is this unconscious mind, which resides below the waterline, right? We use this iceberg metaphor or analogy here with Freud's model for the levels of consciousness. It's the unconscious 
that by and large drives your behavior. What's interesting is that at the top here, the conscious mind, literally, right, in this little diagram, is just the tip of the iceberg. Residing below that tip of the iceberg, conscious mind and conscious behavior is all of the seething cauldrons of desires and impulses and sexual desires and aggressive and violent impulses and other kinds of impulses that are um, shunned by society, that are looked down upon or frowned upon by society. We don't let those things bubble up to the surface. Okay, we keep them down at this unconscious level. And in fact, on this diagram, we also have Freud's three structures in personality. We're going to talk about the id, the ego, and the superego in just a minute. Okay, but the, the take-home message here is that much of what makes us tick, according to Freud's model, in fact, most of what makes us tick, is contained down here in the unconscious. And in fact, what's cool about his model is that his approach to treatment that we're going to talk about in the final segment of the course is called psychoanalytic therapy. And psychoanalytic therapy, we're going to say, has as its goal this, to make the unconscious conscious. That's, that's all he wants to do. When you come in for treatment and you're really anxious or you're really depressed or you're having some other kind of problem, he would say, our goal is to make the unconscious conscious. Bring that stuff up to the surface, examine it, interpret it, maybe via dream interpretation or a bunch of other techniques. And when we do that, that will alleviate your problems with depression or your problems with anxiety. That kind of insight is what's necessary for you to get better. So we, we really need to spell out, I guess, what he says is going on here in terms of the tensions here between and among and ego and superego. So let's lay those guys out on this next slide here and talk about each of them in turn. Let's begin with id. Id is the most primitive part of personalities, according to Freud's model. And it consists of all of your basic biological urges. So sexual impulses, hunger, thirst, aggressive or violent impulses, etc. Basic biological urges. And it abides by or it adheres to something known as the pleasure principle. What's the pleasure principle? Well, it was an old Janet Jackson album. But the pleasure principle is a principle that says, I want satisfaction now regardless, regardless of consequences, consequences or cost, okay? So the pleasure principle, which drives the id, basically doesn't care if you were to act on an impulse and it were to lead to you getting in trouble, getting fired, getting arrested, or what, it doesn't matter. It's immediate satisfaction, right? Instant gratification of these urges is all the id wants. Now, stop there for a second. If that was the only thing that drove our personalities, that made us do what we do, would we get much done? Probably not. <laughs> we wouldn't be particularly productive, right? We'd, we'd be acting on these base urges, sexual and aggressive and violent impulses, hunger and thirst and so forth. So. We have this seething cauldron of drives housed in the id. Luckily, we have a way to check that. And the way that we check that, according to Freud's model, is via the superego. And if I were to give you one word to remember what the superego is about, it's your conscience. And it's important that you spell that right, because we're talking about conscious and unconscious here. Unconscious here with Freud's model. So conscience, right, conscience. Our sense of right or wrong is housed in the superego. The superego basically represents the internalized rules that we learn from our parents and through our parents, the rules of society, right? In, in another way, thinking about the superego, we could say that the superego consists of relatively primitive do's, I was trying to type in do's and don'ts. Right? It has all of the thou shalt not kinds of restrictions. Right? It's sort of like the personality equivalent of the Ten Commandments. Right? Thou shalt not hit thy boss in, a head, in the head with a brick. Right? 
That's what the super ego says. The id, like, hit him, hit him, hit him. Right? So you can imagine, right, if we look at id and super ego, there's going to be a lot of tension there, isn't there? They're not going to get along really well. This is, this is really screaming for a mediator, and that's the role that the ego plays. The ego is trying to pragmatically meet the id's impulses based on the real world and the real world's demands. That's what reality, that's what the, the reality principle is about. That's what pragmatism is about. Okay? So meet id's impulses without what? Without violating rules of the real world. Okay? So pragmatically meeting these impulses based on the real world and the real demands of that real world. Right? You can't you can't go around hitting your boss in the head with a brick. You're going to get in trouble, you're going to get fired, you're going to get arrested, you're going to go to jail. Okay? So the id wants to somehow be aggressive towards this person. The superego has the restriction that says, thou shalt not hit thy boss in the head with a brick. And the ego is trying to, like, can, can we all get along? Can we find a way to work this out? Um, okay, maybe what we'll do here, if the ego has its way, is we will maybe show up late for work. Or we won't get this project done our, on time. We'll slow down the progress as we work on this project. Um, maybe we'll purposely break something at work that will keep us from being able to progress in what we're working on, right? These sort of passive-aggressive ways in some ways might be, not always, but might be occasionally how the ego is able to satisfy both the id and the superego. Do you see that, that role? I mean, the ego literally on the side is in the middle, right? And it's this middle man trying to be the, the arbitrator, the negotiator, the great compromiser here between these basic biological urges of the id that it wants to satisfy now and these strict rules and restrictions that the superego possesses. Okay? Let me stop there for a second. Any questions about these three components of personality within Freud's model? Does that make sense? I guarantee you that's a question or two about these different parts of personality and what roles they play in terms of our functioning. So make sure you get your head around those. Now, let me ask you this before we go on to the next slide. When you look at these three different aspects of personality, and if you think about maybe they're being placed together by student housing here at SDSU into a triple as freshmen, how well are these three roommates going to get along? Tell me in the chat box. How well is that going to work? Not well, right? There is going to be a lot of tension. There is going to be um, presumably a fair amount of conflict. Um, people will probably be moving out pretty quickly. Well, in Freud's model, what he suggests is that these inevitable conflicts between and among any of these id, ego, and superego, they're probably going to result in increased anxiety. Anxiety is going to be produced by the fact that these three elements of personality are going to be at odds with each other, no matter, really, no matter what we do. Okay? What we need is a way to combat that anxiety that results from these inevitable conflicts between, among, id, ego, and superego. So what do we do? We engage in things like repression or other defense mechanisms to try to alleviate anxiety. So the defense mechanisms down here are all aimed at alleviating anxiety. We're going to talk about repression, and then after we talk about repression, we're going to review four others. We're going to introduce them on the next slide and then give each of them their own slide. Repression is the most basic defense mechanism via which we just bury it. Right? When you repress something, you push it out of your conscious awareness and you just don't think about it. Okay? So if you've got some kind of you know, sexual impulse, a sexual drive towards some person that you're not allowed to have those feelings towards, you just repress it. You will not think about it. 
Okay. If you have some anxiety that's driven by um, some past experience you have that was pretty horrific, when you use repression to alleviate anxiety, you just bury it. You just won't think about it. You just won't talk about it. Okay. By the way, when we say these things alleviate anxiety, you could actually turn Freud on his head here and talk about this in a behavioral sense. Let's talk about this in a learning or an operant conditioning way. When you use repression or other defense mechanisms to reduce your anxiety, what kind of operant conditioning scenario is that? Tell me in the chat box. What does that sound like to you? You do this and you get rid of your anxiety. You reduce your anxiety. What kind of operant conditioning setup is that? I do the behavior and it reduces anxiety. And don't all jump at once. Definitely not positive punishment. Negative reinforcement is the way to go here, right? Because we learned a way to get rid of this stuff that we don't like. We don't like the anxiety. Repress it. Or what else can I do? Well, I could also use displacement or a reaction formation or rationalization or projection. So these are going to be the five defense mechanisms we talk about. Again, the first of which was repression. That was the just bury it approach. And we've got two through five listed here. All of them are strategies that we use to avoid the anxiety. And we have this little phrase, avoid the anxiety. That's what brings up the idea of negative reinforcement. Like when you take the Advil and it makes your headache go away. We may, we may not be consciously aware that we're doing these things, but we are doing them. And again, the goal of doing them is to reduce anxiety. So we've talked about repression. Let's take about five minutes and review these other four as well. So number two is displacement, defense mechanism in which we do what I like to call the old drag and drop trick. Right? With this one, we're doing drag and drop. What are we dragging and dropping? We're dragging concerns and conflicts and issues from one situation, like work, and we're pulling them over here and we're dropping it on to this person who's not even connected with work at all. So it says here on the slide, desires that cannot be fulfilled in one context may be displaced onto another. So unfulfilled aggression at work reveals itself at home. I might be engaging in displacement if I'm angry about how you guys do on test number one, and I come home and I yell at my sons, and they didn't even do anything. That's displacement. Okay. If you go home because you're frustrated with something that happened at school and you kick your dog, that's mean, that's nasty, and that's also displacement, right? Dragging and dropping from one situation to another situation. If you're frustrated with some of the drivers you encountered on your commute home and your girlfriend calls and you're mean to her, that's displacement. Okay? Number three, reaction formation. I think about reaction formation as the do the opposite defense mechanism. In this situation, what happens? Well, I have a blocked desire that gets replaced by behavior that is opposite of its original intent. Okay? So I have an unrequited love. That means an unreciprocated love. I love someone, but they don't love me. What happens with the love? The love gets turned on its head. I basically take the reciprocal of love. One over love would be hate, right? Or maybe I don't really like, I'm a five-year-old, and I don't really like this new baby brother that they just brought home because he has turned my world upside down. He used to be just fine and dandy when it was just me. Now they bring him home, and everything is about the baby. I don't like him, but if I do this reaction formation thing, I don't want to admit to not liking this baby because, good Lord, everybody else seems to really, really like him. Let's do the opposite. I'm going to smother him with affection. I'm going to kiss him and say, oh, I love my baby brother, mum, 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 and bring him his blanket and his teddy bear and his rattle and all that good stuff. I'm doing the opposite. Okay. I might use rationalization to protect myself from anxiety. What I come up with with rationalization is a reasonable, reasonable sounding excuse slash explanation. What does that mean? Well, 
if I am abusive towards my kids, I might say I'm beating them for their own good. That is an unacceptable behavior to beat your children, to be physically abusive towards your kids and how you discipline them. Okay? I might spin that and say, it's, this is the spin zone here. This is for their own good, right? I really, really want these grapes. This is Aesop's fable with the fox who can't reach the grapes. Because he can't reach them, he says, you know what? Those grapes are probably sour. That's where that expression comes from, by the way. Right? The analogous one would be, you go to the movies, you're dying to see whatever the latest hot movie is, you get there, it's sold out. And what do you say? You know what I heard? It's it's probably not even that good of a movie. That's all right. We can, we'll do something else. Okay? So I come up with some reasonable sounding excuse, right? I, I, I might be rationalizing something away as a parent if I said, I'm not going to send you any more money to help with your education because I want you to b learn to be independent. Oh, really? Okay. That's the reason, right? You have a test coming up. You're not studying. Your roommate says, don't you have a test in that on Tuesday? You're like, you know what? Last time when I studied, I didn't do, I actually did worse than I did on the first test when I didn't study. So that's why, yeah, I'm, I'm done with the studying for that course. I'm going to rationalize that away, come up with this semi-reasonable sounding excuse, some kind of explanation. Finally, projection. With projection, what happens is my own block desires are projected onto someone else. So I won't admit to feeling some way myself. And so what I'll say is the other person feels that way. Now, clearly in this situation, the emotion is jealousy, right? Jealousy is what's lingering around this room. The woman on the right doesn't want to admit to feeling jealous that this woman got all these flowers and balloons. So what she says, to herself at least, is that this woman here, with all the flowers and balloons, is jealous of me. Now that looks bizarre because all she's got is like a tornado over her head. I guess that's what the person on the left would be jealous of, right? So jealousy is projected, like a projector does, right? Shines this on the screen. I project these feelings onto someone else. Okay, you really, really like someone, you don't want to admit that, what do you say? Well, he or she really, really likes me, right? Tell me in the chat box, what's projection? If you say that your boss hates you, what's the real situation if you're using projection? I know he or she really, really hates me. The problem is you hate that person, but you won't admit that. Again, to protect yourself from this anxiety, that results from conflicts between and among id, ego, and superego. You use repression. You use something like displacement or a reaction formation or rationalization or projection to defend yourself effectively from those feelings. Okay? Questions on any of the defense mechanisms? We've got 23 minutes to go. All right. What are the problems with Freud's model? Two big problems. Number one, a lot of his concepts are difficult to measure in a scientific way. It's hard to measure them under controlled laboratory conditions. What does he have? He's got lots of emphasis on things like the unconscious, right? If we put that in all caps here, unconscious. Well, that's hard to measure in a laboratory kind of situation. It's hard to operationally define. It's hard to get your hands around that. In addition to those kinds of concerns, there are concerns raised about things like the amount of sexuality that is part of Freud's model, okay? Childhood sexuality in particular, right? There are concerns about this idea of fixations where you get stuck at an earlier stage of development. Really? Is that what really happens for people? Concerns about that. It's, it's depictions of women in particular are sometimes not the most positive. So for these various different reasons, we get alternative personality theories that are developed. And we're going to talk about three of those alternatives. So we've taken care of Freud, and now we're going to talk about Maslow and Rogers and what they have to say, which again is a direct reaction to some of the criticisms of Freud's model. Right, so this is what we don't like about Freud. Here's our alternative approach. And our alternative approach from these folks is as follows. And by the way, here's Maslow, 
and here's Carl Rogers. They say instead of focusing on those fixations and those hang-ups, instead of emphasizing sexual and aggressive impulses, why don't we do something different? Why don't we talk about what makes us human? Why don't we focus on free choice and self-determination? Let's make the negative tone in Freud's model a positive one and identify and focus on the growth potential of human beings, how we can strive to be something, whether it's as a student or whatever. Why don't we, in fact, talk about self-actualization? This is going to be Maslow's idea, self-actualization, as well as Maslow's idea with this as one of the capstones of his hierarchy of needs. So these guys say, forget about being stuck in childhood and having these kinds of hang-ups and sexual and aggressive impulses. Let's focus on how we strive to maximize our potential in all aspects of our lives. Basically the old army slogan of be all you can be, right? That was the old slogan for the U.S. Army. Then they changed it to an army of one, which was like the dumbest slogan ever, because who wants to be in an army of one? What does it mean? <laughs> mean to be all you can be? It means for you guys, right? You are students, you are roommates, you are brothers and sisters, you are sons and daughters, you are boyfriends and girlfriends, you are coworkers, you are teammates. You, you've got all these different things that you do, all these different roles that you play. And Maslow says we need to focus on how you try to maximize your potential, strive towards being the best, whatever we're talking about, son or daughter, student, girlfriend, teammate, that you can be. Okay? In fact, he puts this, again, at or near the top of his hierarchy of needs. So we're going to take a quick look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What I'm going to tell you is you do not need to memorize the different rungs in the ladder here. I just have two points that I want to make about his hierarchy of needs. Okay? Here are the two points I want to make. Number one, I want to make the point, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm an idiot. I'm trying to type blue on blue. No, the first point I want to make is that we move up as lower needs are met. In other words, we do something like this. When our physiological needs are taken care of, we move on to safety needs. When we take care of those, we move on to belongingness and love needs. Then we move on to esteem needs. It has to do with recognition and respect from others. And ultimately, we strive towards, as we said before, self-actualization. Right? We're moving to try to live up to our full and unique potential. Okay, that's part one of what I want you to get about his hierarchy of needs. Again, this is from Maslow. Part two that I want you to get is this idea that if lower needs are unmet, then we move down the hierarchy, right? So if something happens, and that's what we're depicting here with this un poor unfortunate soul, right? His, his village, his town has been flooded, and he's trying to find his next meal. So if he was up here striving towards fulfilling his unique potential, um, yeah, not so much anymore. I'm going to jump down here and figure out where my next meal is going to come from and where I'm going to be sleeping tonight because that bottom rung on this ladder has become really, really wobbly. Right. I need to jump down to that. If the lower needs are unmet, we then move down the hierarchy. Okay? Those are the two things I want you to understand. You do not need to memorize the sequence here from top to bottom or bottom to top. What's the feel there from that model? Is that a much more positive and optimistic tone versus what we got from Freud? What do you guys think? Does this sound like a more kind of hopeful depiction of the human condition? of personality, yeah, I mean, just, this is like a, a sort of warm kind of feeling, like people are really good, people are really trying to do things, okay, that's why they're doing this, because they say, you know, all the stuff that Freud gave us is just too much negativity, all this unconscious stuff and psychic determinism, so we need to move in a different direction, and that's exactly what they did with their approach. 
let's do these last two. We'll talk about Bandura. He's our old friend from the section on observation and learning. So not surprisingly, one of his three big ideas that we're going to emphasize today is that of observational learning, right? He says that our personality development is directly attributable to observational learning kinds of mechanisms. What does that mean? Well, if you learn to be a conscientious student, it might be because you saw your parents behaving in a conscientious way in their jobs. You saw your older brothers and sisters or your cousins being dutiful and studious students. Okay? You learn to be outgoing and talkative in the life of the party because like, that's what went on at holidays at your house. Okay? So we pick up those things from others in our environment. Number two, big idea, is the notion of reciprocal determinism. Reciprocal just means a two-headed arrow. And so this model suggests that there are reciprocal interactions between and among our thoughts, our environment, and our behavior. So that's what we've got depicted over here, right? Notice the two-headed arrows. This is affecting that, and it's going the other way as well. This reminds me of the reciprocal interactions we said that exist between parents and babies when we talk about attachment, right? How does that unfold what factors influence attachment? Well, moms affect babies and babies affect moms. Well, in this case, we're using the example of um, an interest in it, an engagement in rock climbing behavior. Where does that come from? Why do some people start doing that? Well, this would say that things like your thoughts about risky activities like rock climbing influence your likelihood of doing that behavior. Environmental factors like do your friends all do this activity? That influences whether you do this or not. Then when you do the behavior, that might make you more likely to have more friends that do it, and it might also alter in that direction your thoughts and your feelings about rock climbing or other similar kinds of potentially risky behaviors. Okay? So the point here is all these things interact. Right? Reciprocity or reciprocal relationships are ones where the arrow goes in both directions. It goes back to day one of the class. right? We talked about the cognitive behavioral model, which said thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are the three corners of a triangle, right? And arrows point in both directions to connect those three factors to each other. That's his second big idea, reciprocal determinism. The final one is probably my favorite one in his model. It's called self-efficacy. It's another central construct or another central um, variable here, according to Bandura. We're going to define self-efficacy in this way. It is the belief that you can perform adequately in a particular situation, and I would actually underline that in a particular situation, part of the definition, because that's what makes this different from self-esteem, right? Self-esteem is a general kind of global feeling about yourself. How do you feel about yourself as an individual? Do you feel like you're a good person overall or a bad person overall? Do you feel like you're a competent person overall or not? That's different. Self-efficacy is specific to a particular situation. So as a student in a physics class, what is your degree of self-efficacy? Do you think you can do A, B, C, D, and E that are the necessary parts of being a successful student in this physics course? Separate and distinct from that, you can have self-efficacy beliefs about your abilities as an athlete, as a musician, as a social person, right? Do you think you have what's necessary to be successful as a musician, right? Can I do one, two, three, four, or five that are part of being successful in that regard? What I love about self-efficacy is it ends up affecting a lot of things that really, really matter, especially in an educational kind of situation. Self-efficacy influences two things that are huge in determining whether you are successful as a student or not. It influences how much effort you expend. And I think even more importantly, it influences how long you persist in the face of difficult life situations, or in one word, adversity. Okay? Think about it. Two people. One person has high self-efficacy beliefs, one person doesn't. They're taking a physics class. The, the high self-efficacy person believes that they have A, B, C, D, and E that are necessary to succeed in physics. 
They work really, really hard, and when they do poorly on a quiz, they don't give up. They get extra help, they reread their notes, they watch some videos online, and they work even harder. Contrast that high self-efficacy belief person with a low self-efficacy belief person. What does a low self-efficacy person do when they fail that quiz? Tell them in the chat box. What do you do if you don't think you have the wherewithal to pass this class? Something goes wrong, and what do you do? What's the response when there's adversity? You give up. You stop trying, right? You kind of roll over, and, and you're done, okay? So it's a question of how much do you believe that you can do something, right? Do you think you can do it or not? And the reason that's so very important, again, is because it influences how hard you try and how long you keep on keeping on. Does this remind you of the storybook from when you were a little kid? A story your parents almost certainly should have read to you when you were little. What about the train? Not Thomas the train. You know it's something about trains. What is it? The little engine that could. Yes, that's it. The little engine that could. If you haven't ever read that, seriously, you need to like go and read it now. Find it online somewhere and read it, right? What is the little engine that could trying to do? He's trying to get over this mountain that he has never made it over before. What does he say to himself that's high self-efficacy beliefs as he's going up that mountain? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think. He doesn't give up. Man, that's hard. That's adversity, right? He's facing some difficult challenges there. But he doesn't just give up because it's hard. Come on, right? You keep trying. That's really at the core of the self-efficacy belief. And Bandura thinks this is a major part of what makes us tick in terms of personality. All right? Let me stop there for a second. Questions on Bandura's ideas? Okay. So that's the third model. Let's bounce back to this side. We've got to you know, keep checking off our checklist. So Bandura is done. The last one is Cattell and his five-factor model. Now, remember, we took a quick glance at this when we had this slide up regarding nature and nurture. And we had these different traits on the bottom. These are actually Cattell's big five or five-factor um, elements here that he thinks are the defining um, personality dimensions on which people vary. So Raymond Cattell, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, puts together the five-factor model. And how he constructs his model is really amazing. It's empirically derived, which means it's based on observations. And basically, he begins with an unabridged dictionary from which he extricates 4,500 adjectives like friendly, outgoing, scary, dependable, Etc. right? Anxious. Saw how those grouped together ended up with 16 personality dimensions. And when he got 16, he did a further what's called factor analysis. You really didn't understand what that's about, but it's a statistical procedure that lets you sort of keep boiling things down, right? If you pretend you had a 100-item questionnaire and you were wondering, like, what are the five key dimensions that are on this questionnaire? When he boiled this down, he ended up with five dimensions. And these are the big five personality factors, which are best depicted with this table from your textbook, table 13.3. They spell out the word canoe, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion. And for each of these, we could basically say on the left side, we are low on that dimension. So all the way down for each of these five, this is the low side of the scale. Lameka is having another scale here continuum. That's a shocker, right? And on the right side, we've got folks who are high on that dimension. So let's look at each of these. And I would say, as you think about each of these dimensions, think of characters in books or TV shows or movies, right? Or relatives, maybe, who might fall on one or the other end of each of these different dimensions, right? So if I'm low in conscientiousness, I'm disorganized, I'm careless, I'm impulsive, I am not the person that you want to have picking you up from the airport when you return to San Diego. 
I want the high conscientiousness person to do that. They're organized, they're careful, they're disciplined, right? These are the students you want to have, trust me. And if you are a teacher or professor, you want students who are high on conscientiousness. You don't want the students that are low on conscientiousness because they're the ones that cause the headaches, right? They don't do the stuff that you tell them to do. They're careless, they're disorganized, they turn in things late all the time or never at all. Dimension number two is agreeableness. How easy to get along with are you? Well, if you're low on this dimension, you're ruthless, suspicious, and uncooperative. You're sort of cranky. If you're high on this dimension, soft-hearted, trusting, helpful, kind of low maintenance. Like, if you go to the movies and the movie sold out, you're like, ah, I don't care. We could go do anything. As long as we get to hang out, I'm, I'm cool with that. It doesn't matter, right? Low on agreeableness, you're going to gripe and bitch about it the rest of the weekend. Neuroticism. Are you emotionally stable or not? On the left side here, if you're low on neuroticism, you don't get upset. You're calm and you're cool and you're collected. When the going gets rough, that's the person you want. Low in neuroticism, right? High neuroticism. Who's that? That's like Woody Allen in any movie he's ever been in, right? Very worried and fretful all the time. Totally insecure. Okay? That's the neuroticism dimension. Openness is often referred to as openness to experience. How willing, basically, are you to try new things? If you're low on this dimension, uh, yeah, I got my routine. I got my way of doing things. I'm not messing with that, right? This is like Sheldon on Big Bang, right? He's low on openness to experience. He does. Nobody's sitting in my seat, and we always eat this certain kind of food on this night. Right? If you are open to experience, you're imaginative, you prefer variety, you're much more than, you know, um, it's a totally different kind of feel, right? So, again, think of some different characters um, that might fit on those different dimensions. I'm thinking of, I can't think of the character's name, um, but the blonde-haired woman who's in Big Bang Theory. Um, she's probably high on that openness to experience dimension, right? Finally, down the bottom here, extroversion. Are you outgoing and talkative or not? Right? Penny, thank you. Penny. Penny. Penny, thank you. I don't know how I forgot her name. Um, I could picture her, but I couldn't remember her name. Extroversion. If you're introverted, you're on the low end of this dimension. So that's actually where we would use the term you're an introvert, right? Just read a really good book about introverts um, called Quiet. Um, I think it's like three or four books, uh, three or four bucks um, as a Kindle book. Um, really worth worth a good read there. Extroverted folks, these are like you know the the captain of the cheer team and the student um, government president. They're sociable, they're fun loving, they're affectionate. They're the ones that you know are just the life of the party. Okay, so everybody falls somewhere along these different dimensions, and I guess ultimately what you could get. Right is is some kind of a of a of a profile right um, across these five different dimensions. All right. Questions about these big five personality factors from Patel. I'm going to ask you a polling question because I haven't done that all day, and I don't like talking as much as I've had to talk today. But I kind of needed to to get us through this. So let me give you a polling question here before we wrap up. And notice I've taken the big five, and now instead of canoe, what have I made it spell? Ah, it also spells ocean. That is spooky. All right, take a shot at that question. We've got a studious and hardworking student. She's never late for class. Always turns in assignments on time. Which dimension is she going to score high on? A, B, C, D, or E. Again, you answer by rolling over the letter A up above the participant list and then scrolling down to whatever your answer choice might be. While you're finishing up, um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do online office hours. Just leave this session open only until about 11, 10 or 11, 15. I've got to run over to the faculty staff club because I'm doing a presentation at a Center for Teaching and Learning lunch today. Um, so I'll just kind of linger with you guys. And if you don't have any, if you just want to leave, just go. That's fine. Um, I'm going to... Um, try to um, finish up and, and give you guys some attention during that, that next 20 or 30 minutes here. 
Okay. Let's take a look at how you did with this one. Oh, that's pretty good. 31 out of 35 responses. Conscientiousness, right? This is the person who's described as what? Well, I am organized, careful, and disciplined. Yeah, that sounds exactly like the person was depicted in that question. All right? So we've taken care of that last of the major perspectives here, five-factor model. Let's finish up our checklist. So that's done. If we go back to our first slide, we took care of everything other than theories, and now we've done that. So we can check all personality, right? So again, the breakdown for test number three, nine on intelligence, 11 for development, eight for emotion, 12 on personality, probably a fair amount, about 40, because we spent probably you know, close to 40% of our time this morning covering Freud's ideas. All right? Any final questions on anything before we wrap up for today? All right, so again, test number two, I'm sorry, test number three. On Tuesday, we start at 9.30. Don't show up later than 9.55 or you won't be able to take the test at that point. So um, good luck with the studying. Also, do not forget that you have two chapters worth of learning curve activities that are due Sunday night. You've got both the chapter on um, emotion, stress, and health, and this chapter on personality, all right? Have a great weekend. Good luck with the studying. If you need anything, just email me. I'm real good at getting back to you that way. All right, have a great rest of your Thursday, and I'll see you guys on Tuesday.